Dear friends, the Universal Church in general, the Indian Church in particular, all the more, we as a community here, is grateful to God for the great personality of St. Thomas, the Apostle, for having given us, given to us as our patron, patron of the church, especially the church of the Sira Malabar. I'm afraid when I was asked by Jomohan to speak about St. Thomas, because so many St. Thomas missionaries are sitting around. But to speak about St. Thomas to those people, I don't know how how fit I am, or how well how equipped I am, but still, I thought whatever it is, whatever comes to my mind, whatever is inspiration given to me by God, speak. So at the outset itself, I would like to express the greetings of the day, especially to the MST fathers, BST sisters, our calling who celebrated this feast, and all of you. As we celebrate the feast of St. Thomas, as we remember him with gratitude, as we thank God, let us also try to commit ourselves to the cause of the call that God has given to us. Once a parish priest decided to give a uh, well prepared sermon to his parishioners, and he took almost two, three days took so much of effort and pain to prepare the sermon. And when the time came to deliver the sermon, he was shocked because hardly only, only two people turned up for the service. He was discouraged and disappointed because he has wasted so much of time in preparing the sermon. But however, he made up his mind. He said, I have taken so much of pain to prepare the sermon, whether it is two people or hundred people, I am going to bombard, I am going to blast. And he started his sermon. After the sermon was over, after the service was over, one of the exhausted parishioners, who was one of them who attended the service, came and told the father, Father, it was too much. Father, it was too much. And father got a little angry and in the sense he said, I took so much of pain to prepare. It is not my fault that people did not turn up. So I need to get to the fruit of my labor. So I am prepared. So I, I spoke. So the person said, suppose father, you are going to a poultry to feed hundred hen. You have prepared food for hundred. And when you reach the poultry, there are only two. And if you provide the food of the hundred, what would be the situation of that two hen? Then he was away to his own way, in his own way. So I hope after the sermon you all may even out to tell me, Father, it was too much. Anyway, when we come to the life of St. Thomas, <coughs> little is recorded of St. Thomas the Apostle. Thomas was probably born in Galilee to a humble family, but there is no indication that he was a fisherman. He was a Jew. But there is no account of how he became an apostle of Christ. Nevertheless, thanks to the fourth gospel, his personality is clearer to us than some of the other twelve. Thomas' name occurs in the Bible in the gospel of Matthew chapter 10 verse 3, Mark 3.18, Luke 6.15, and in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 13, in list of the Apostles. But in the Gospel of St. John, he plays a particularly distinct part. Thomas is often condemned for his lack of belief. But Thomas was equally courageous, willing to stand by Jesus in dangerous times. He also relentlessly sought the truth like an inquisitive child 
he constantly asked the questions. And of course, his wonderful profession, my Lord and my God, is the clearest declaration of Jesus' divinity in the scripture. I would like to share four aspects, of course, three connected with the with St. Thomas, and the fourth one comes with this in connection with the, our own uh, missionary life. I'd like to like, share these four points. First of all, Thomas, a loyal follower. When Jesus announced his intention of visiting the recently deceased Lazarus in Judea, a few miles from Jerusalem, and dangerously close for someone as popular as he, Thomas said, let's also go and die with him. We read it in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 11, verses 16. When the worried disciples wanted to keep Jesus from going for fear, he would be stoned. Thomas, in a moment of bravery, not often expressed by apostles before Pentecost, rallied the others to stay there, to stay by their master, come what may. That's why we, we call him, or I, I prefer to call him as a loyal follower. Whatever be the situation, whatever be the consequences, he is ready to stay with the master. The second is Thomas, inquisitive student. Later in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 5, it was Thomas who raised an objection prior to the Last Supper. We read the Gospel of John 14, 1 to 5. Do not let your hearts trouble. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. For I, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come and again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you also may be. And you know the way where I am going. That is the uh, teaching Jesus gave to his disciples. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? With the keenness typical of the twelve, Thomas misunderstands Jesus' reference to his death and resurrection. Jesus, Thomas, Thomas' question provides Jesus an opportunity to teach one of the most profound and difficult truths of his ministry. Jesus said to Thomas in 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The anxiety, eagerness to know the truth is expressed in the question of Thomas. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? The third is a very popular one. Common we use, we, are, we attribute to Thomas. is the doubting Thomas. There is no dispute that Thomas was a doubter because uh, gospel itself records that he did not believe. Now the question is, what did he not believe? I don't think there is a second opinion that he was a person of doubt. But the question is, what did he doubt? Did he doubt the resurrection, the truth of the resurrection? Did he doubt the narration the disciples gave about the appearance of Jesus? Or did he doubt his, uh, doubt the authenticity of his own discipleship. And I would like to think that he doubted the authenticity of his own discipleship. Because we have a reference in the Gospel of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, where St. Paul narrates how he encountered Jesus in his life and how he got the authority to preach the gospel. Because there was a talk among the disciples that who gave him this authority to preach because he was a person who stood against the gospel. And when he now boldly speaks it, preaches it, 
who gave him the authority. And uh, St. Paul gives this narration in order to prove that he had an encounter with the Christ, with the Christ, and Christ has captured him, and Christ has given him this authority to preach. I think St. St. Thomas also might have taken the same method in order to, when the other disciples said that we have seen and you are not seen. So you are somebody lower, we are somebody greater. We are greater than you. You come to a second level. Thomas might have left, felt as if his discipleship is questioned and his discipleship is challenged. So in order to prove that I am also an equal disciple with equal rights, he says, I will not believe. Unless he comes and gives me a vision. This is, this is right. Right to demand. If I am a disciple whom you have called, and if I have followed you faithfully all these three years of life, what deprives me of having this vision of the risen Christ? And he demands this sign or this vision that he can be inculcated or he can be incorporated into the uh, company of the disciples as a true disciple. I, I would like to think in this way, other than that he doubted the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus, when St. Thomas demands this right, comes very happily in order to show his own intimacy with the disciple. Disciple Thomas very freely comes, come and do what you want. That is to see and touch. Other disciples preferably have not got the chance of placing their hands on the risen Jesus. When they came, don't touch me. That's what Jesus said. He told others, don't touch me. Because I have to go. But Thomas, he says, you come and touch me. Because that is your demand. That is your demand. And the words do not doubt. It means you are my own disciple whom I have chosen, whom I have called. And I also elevate you into the status of disciple like, like any other ten. And uh, this demand of Jesus is, uh, the demand of Thomas is fulfilled by the vision that Jesus gives to him. In John 20-25, we have the narration today that eight days later Thomas made his act of faith. He fell at the feet of Jesus and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus replied, Because you have seen me, Thomas, you believed. Blessed are, those, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. The statement of Thomas, I will not believe, may be seen as his bargaining tactics. He is, you know, we also go to, we also go and bargain, you know, to get things within our own capacity. Thomas also makes a kind of bargaining with Jesus to get what he needs. So, if I too am your disciple, give me the same privilege to me also so that I may become equal with others. Vision of the risen Jesus gives authenticity to disciple authenticity to the discipleship of Jesus, the, the discipleship of Thomas, there is power to preach the gospel. As I said already, St. Paul, he narrates how he encountered Jesus in his life and got the authority, the power to preach the gospel. Thomas might have done the same to prove his discipleship and the authentic authenticity, the authority to the fourth aspect is the blessedness. Saint Jesus says, "Blessed are those who believe." That those who blessed are those who believe without seeing. And I think this can be applied to each of us. Blessed are those who do not see yet believe. Though we have not seen the risen Lord, we believe that we are called by Him. To be his followers and we I hope not ask for a vision ask for a sign to establish to prove our discipleship do we feel and experience and radiate the blessedness in our life if we believe that we are following him or we follow him 
without seeing and if Jesus says that blessed are they who follow without seeing then we need to experience that blessedness in our life and we need to create that blessedness to the world around. Are we able to proclaim with conviction and faith like Thomas, my Lord and my God? Let's pray earnestly as we celebrate this Eucharist through the power, power, powerful intercession of Thomas that God may give us zeal and, zeal and conviction to affirm that we have received from Christ the mandate to preach the gospel and may do it faithfully by proclaiming my Lord and my God not only by our life, our lips but also our lives. Amen.